foundation in the sense that what comes later is going to be compatible with that. So a Release 15 device can work 10 years from now, even if it's purchased three years from now. So this aspect of the system uh, being forward compatible because it's part of the same family of the air interface. And, and hence, the new radio represents this new uh, departure in the sense it's a new design. It's different than LTE. Obviously, there's some, some trade-offs and some similarities in certain areas, but it is the new radio. One of the key things is that it didn't, however, say, hey, we need a new four-letter acronym. Obviously, uh, Qualcomm and many other companies are looking at modulation and waveform and multiplexing. Uh, we're looking at uh, interesting approaches beyond OFDM. At the same time, OFDM was chosen for a very good reason of the multiplexing, enabling MIMO, uh, enabling scheduling on time frequency grids. So we'll have optimized OFDM-based waveforms, but doing it in a much more um, uh, you know, integrated way Whereas we mentioned on this common flexible framework. So how can we multiplex different services, different latency requirements? When LTE was designed, it was for a given you know, one millisecond air interface subframe design. Knowing how much we were gonna have to support these different requirements, we designed 5G from the start with a more scalable design, both in frequency because of all the different bands and bandwidths, but then also in time because of the different latency requirements. And then the other thing is, like every G, not only have we gone higher in band and wider in bandwidth, we become more directional. So how can we enable a more optimized performance, multiplexing much larger number of devices in the same amount of area or space? Well, the answer is the whole system becomes more directional. And as we showed in the 802.11 AD, RFIC, and the upcoming SDX50, we're embedding large number of antenna arrays in a very small you know, form factors. Obviously, that's because the wavelength is smaller because we're at higher bands in some of these scenarios. So that enables massive MIMO uh, in sub six gigahertz TDD bands, and it also enables uh, very interesting beam switching, beam tracking designs in millimeter wave. So the whole system is becoming more directional and more optimized. So the key challenge was having a design across these spectrum types and bands, not only for licensed, but then also for unlicensed. So that's kind of part of the overall uh, framework. And as we mentioned, we're basically in the process of wrapping up the release 14 study item. So there's a lot of very active debate uh, where we, our teams are kind of traveling globally, talking with all the operators and vendors uh, and new entrants as well. And okay, what are your priorities for um, you know, interesting study items in release 15? And at the same time, uh, what are the priorities to make sure we have a very concrete, a high performing release 15 work item? And in particular, that work item being uh, specified to enable um, you know, acceleration of the overall process for integrated design of non-standalone, where there's LTE, 5G interworking on the network side, and then also, as part of that, delivering a very solid standalone design uh, at the end of release 15. So the ability to advance both standalone and non-standalone in an integrated standardization effort. And something that might not be well understood you know, by the investor community is that the 3GBP uh, process itself across all the working groups, i.e. the people who are arguing about channel coding or the people who are discussing network architecture, it operates as an overall project plan, just like any large project. So there is a, a focus on getting the design right and then also sticking to a schedule. So yes, it is aggressive to drive through release 15. At the same time, there's a lot of careful work that goes on behind the scenes to make sure that, the, um, that it's an implementable time frame given the volume of work that has to happen. So it is a large amount of work, but as we said, there's large amount, the teams are large, and it is part of a highly integrated global effort. So given that strong desire for initial launches in 2019, the timeline for 5G really has shifted left relative to the sort of discussions people were having a couple years ago. And so if we look at then some of the different key parts, so we have uh, you know, teams working on each of these uh, different parts, but doing it in a very integrated way. And so the aspect of well, what are the techniques that make the most sense for sub six gigahertz? What are the, the approaches for millimeter wave that are you know, similar to those, but more optimized for the even higher bands where it's much more directional? So looking at a, kind of a net design for sub six, net design for millimeter wave, net design for spectrum sharing. So that's the whole point is we don't want to have five different deployments based on five different specifications. We want to have that you know, efficiency both in terms of a multi-mode device that's going to support sub six gigahertz and millimeter wave, operate on license bands and on license bands, and support advanced 
802.11 technologies. Obviously, Qualcomm is an expert at integrating that into the modem. And at the same time, we want the system at the software level and at the network level to also interwork closely with other technologies like LTE and obviously, you know, Wi-Fi. So the ability to design an end-to-end -end system. So it is a larger perspective that all the companies are taking, but at the same time, from Qualcomm's standpoint, this is where we feel we're, we're playing to our strengths of how we approach design, prototyping, standardization, and design. And so some of the key parts were, you know, we've been talking about these techniques for, you know, many years now, but it's exciting to see how this is getting incorporated into the Release 14, you know, study item decisions already. So even though Release 14 was a study item, the conclusions coming out of that are incorporated into the work item, and so many decisions are being made as that process is moving forward. And, and some of the key ones are the scalable OFDM numerology that we're trying to design for different bands and bandwidths. We're trying to enable more spatial techniques like massive MIMO, uh, as Matt said, pushing the energy per bit. We kind of kind of picojoule per bit sort of energy metrics to how can we increase the throughput without uh, significantly increasing the battery consumption. And then really the, the interesting parts of well, what's different at the physical layer for 5G relative to 4G was well, the uh, opportunity to design a new subframe. So how can we think a little more creatively in terms of having a more TDD focused design where we're leveraging reciprocity. The bit is you can listen and then you're gonna transmit on the same band. That's what defines TDD. So incorporating that sort of approach to having a more optimized uh, slot structure in 5G was one of the key interesting design components where we've been working for many years saying, well, what are some of the things we would do differently? How can we make sure we're enabling these, these spatial approaches and at the same time still deliver efficiency in a large number of scenarios. And so this prototype platform is where we implement all of these algorithms and it's one of those other exciting parts that uh, kind of core to Qualcomm's role is that the same engineers who are part of designing the team are, are working very uh, hand in hand with our hardware, firmware, software engineers to implement these algorithms to make sure as we're pushing the boundaries that we're also maintaining it in the, in the implementable and feasible uh, prototype platforms. So this is just a little bit more detail on the numerology. So whereas LTE was a 15 kilohertz tone spacing, that is the width of these OFDM tones here. Um, so sure, that's 15 kilohertz is gonna be part of 5G. At the same time, uh, as we're shooting to wider bandwidths, like 100 megahertz, uh, for example, if China Mobile ends up getting 100 megahertz of spectrum uh, in, in the 3.4 gigahertz band in China, you know, they would want to deploy, for example, a 100 megahertz uh, carrier as opposed to a 20 megahertz LTE carrier. So the notion of, in general, uh, depending on which band you're talking about, people are shooting for wider bandwidths for the given actual carrier. So what's the widest band um, you know, contiguous before you resort to aggregating parallel bands. And so that's the aspect of, of shooting for wider bandwidths, um, you know, even in outdoor and small cell scenarios, uh, for example, in the TDD three and four gigahertz bands, uh, but then also even in indoor wideband as we're designing for unlicensed spectrum, we would be shooting for bandwidths even wider, for example, 160 megahertz. And in millimeter wave, we might be at 400 megahertz. Other numbers where we're leveraging the fact that the band is much wider and so then we change the subcarrier spacing. So this is an example of, so all of these uh, different subcarrier spacings will be part of 5G and are, they're already uh, basically decided in release 14. So it's the aspect of which ones make the most sense for which scenario. Uh, another part is, is LDPC. Qualcomm has a large uh, channel coding team. It kind of goes deep in our roots. Uh, even obviously uh, Andy Viterbi himself uh, and the Viterbi algorithm obviously was for decoding convolutional codes. So Qualcomm's always had a long history of recruiting you know, channel coding scientists and having them work. So the ability to look at uh, advanced LDPC codes and polar codes, pushing the envelope of other coding challenges, that was also core to how we perform R&D and how we looked at the opportunity of 5G. And so pushing to these gigabit per second data rates was a great example of where taking um, you know, very interesting multi-edge LDPC channel codes uh, from experts like Tom Richardson and others who work at Qualcomm. This was a great way to share these results uh, with the industry in the standardization process. And LDPC codes, um, you know, based on curves like that, were basically adopted uh, for the large uh, code block size EMBB data. So the, the bread and butter mobile broadband multi-gigabit per second data, those channels are gonna use uh, LDPC, 
uh, whereas the control channels, that is the short messages, uh, which don't have uh, hybrid ARQ and other advanced features, those will be implemented using polar codes, uh, where we also have a very active research team. Uh, this is an example of the subframe, and so it's really the, this is the unit of time that gets repeated, and it, it defines in, in, um, in this TDD uh, picture here, it defines the notion of, you know, when the base station is transmitting, uh, for example, control and headers, and then the data can be either downlink or uplink. So as Matt mentioned, one of the interesting things about 5G and these new applications, it's not all just gonna be video download. Obviously that would really hit the sweet spot in the 4G era. But as we look at 5G, as we look at VR, we look at AR, we look at creating content and sharing content, a lot of interesting use cases are also uplink centric. That is more data going from the end user device. And it might be a head mounted display, it might be some other it might be a car, uploading diagnostics. So the aspect of being able to have dynamic up or down, that is from the base station to the user or vice versa, dynamic TDD, but then finishing that, that subframe with a transmission from the device. So you have a bookend where you have downlink at the beginning, an uplink at the end, and in the uplink you can also send, you can embed pilot signals that the base station can listen to and turn that around into spatially steered signals to you. So one of the challenges in, for any uh, modem designer or system designer is, hey, I have this great algorithm. If I knew the channel at the transmitter, that is, I knew the reflections and the phases and the amplitudes, I could do some really interesting processing uh, on the transmit side. Well, the question is, how did you find out the channel? If it was an FDD paired like, spectrum scenario, the user would have to, to send a whole bunch of channel coefficients back on the uplink. The base station would take that, process it, and then decide what to do. In, in 5G, it's a much more dynamic listen, transmit, listen, transmit environment where you're always getting those uplink sounding reference signals. So these are examples of how we can embed in just the right amount of headers to enable unlicensed operation or D to D and mesh and relay, or just the right amount of pilot signals to enable efficient spatial multiplexing. The other thing is then, well, just how far can we push massive MIMO? One of the key points is operators don't wanna go out and deploy a whole bunch of new cell sites uh, just because they're bringing on uh, 3.5 gigahertz uh, band in Europe or China or some other market relative, say, to a two gigahertz LTE band. They wanna reuse the same cell sites. So to reuse those cell sites, uh, they wanna be able to leverage the spatial processing uh, at the base station. So a lot of the advancements, obviously, as Qualcomm's pushing the boundaries of RFICs uh, on, the, on the device side, at the same time that silicon improvements and RF improvements on the base station side also enable more efficient antenna processing and spatial processing in the same array size. So the ability to have, without like these huge antennas, but the ability to have more efficient processing on the network side uh, enables then uh, this more spatially directed transmissions that are also more energy efficient. So this can really improve the edge data rate as well as the median throughput. So as you get into multi-user massive MIMO, that's the key point. You're raising the bar that everyone can experience throughout the cell. And that's really when new applications start coming. If the average data rate, the so-called user experience, reaches a higher level like 50 megabits per second as opposed to five megabits per second, then future versions of Uber and Lyft and other startups are gonna come out of the woodwork saying, hey, I have a new application. So this is some of our demonstration showcase. You're gonna see this uh, when you step outside later in the afternoon for some of the demonstrations, and we'll have this at MWC this week. But we actually have our end-to-end our -end prototype embedded in a, a network simulation looking at the effect of latencies, wide area coverage, you know, what is the actual user experience change uh, in, in different propagation environments, and this is kind of measured data uh, from our working prototype. And then at the same time, we said, okay, as we're pushing that boundary, what about the millimeter wave? So that's the key interesting point that there's huge amounts of spectrum, and, and it's this kind of logarithmic thing, the amount of spectrum between 28 gigahertz and 29 gigahertz, doesn't sound like a lot, but obviously that's a whole gigahertz of spectrum. So the ability to really have interesting high data rate communications in millimeter wave is key. So we have a very active uh, research program on, on 28 gigahertz and looking very closely at all the other bands as well, like 39 gigahertz, 60 gigahertz. Uh, and, and so this, as, as different regulatory environments in different countries are opening up more spectrum here, it's huge amounts of bandwidth. And as we say, we already have a device is working in millimeter wave. So it's a question of designing a system to take advantage of that beam forming and beam tracking and make it mobile. Millimeter wave has always been used for line of sight between cell sites, for example, backhaul. 
uh, the question is how to make it mobile and to make that efficient. So last year we showed you guys uh, some demonstrations of our 20 gigahertz prototype. We've now taken it the next step further. You'll see that both in, in Barcelona and also today. But the ability then to have this non-line of sight operation, to have reflections and tracking those to dynamically allow users to move across the cell, even at these high frequency bands. And so this is some of the, the terminals where uh, we have uh, the device in the vehicle. And we show these kind of pictures, these spherical pictures. And we kind of adopted this sphere pattern because the reality is the handheld device or even a head mounted display, any future device can be in any orientation, right? When you're looking at, at 5G and other use cases, it's not like, you know, we used to do this very specific head blocking measurements and, 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 and Matt and others will remember, you know, we have head mock-ups in our labs and we, we you know, we basically, uh, with an elastic, we hold the phone next to the head. The head's filled with gray matter modeling equipment material, basically. And then we measure all these, these statistics for, for SAR and other things. The reality is in 5G and, and even in 4G today, the device can be in all these different orientations, all these different handholds. So we like to model uh, the UE characteristics in a full sphere. And then we can look at what is the performance at various angles. And so the device will have large numbers of little antenna arrays in it that can turn on and off different subarrays to make sure they're benefiting where the signal strength is largest so that you can basically work around the effects of blocking. And so it's a reality of very interesting things happening on the micro scale at the device and on the macro scale at the cell site where we're, we have uh, G node Bs uh, for the base stations with multi antenna elements and then driving around to look at the handoff perfect, uh, performance and how we can design that system. And so then when we kind of take a step back and uh, as I'm wrapping up here, it's that aspect of how we designed for different bands, different bandwidths, different latencies, uh, different services. For example, where I have mission critical, these very thin purple lines here represent a low latency transmission that's being punctured in to a general mobile broadband system. So one of the benefits of 5G, it was a clean slate design where we said, I'm gonna have to support future very low latency mission critical transmissions. At the same time, I don't want to devote spectrum just for that use case uh, when maybe there's no emergency and the band's not even being used. So I want to be able to multiplex efficiently. And so by co-designing the system through this framework, we can co-design for mission critical low latency transmissions and mobile broadband at the same time. In addition to putting in the hooks to support D to D and multicast and at the same time, you know, scalable systems. So part of it was how do we design for forward compatibility? We want a long runway for 5G so that the network investments made for release 15 continue to enable upgrade possibilities and a wider range of new devices over time. So 5G is not a singularity that occurs with release 15, it's done. Uh, it's something that it's the beginning of a long process. So we wanted to make sure that a sufficiently robust and integrated design was standardized. So that's how we approached it and prototyped it. And it's kind of exciting now where our teams are working very closely with operators and vendors to drive in what are their priorities for release 15. We're implementing that, improving the functionality and then close work with the infrastructure vendors as well so that there's a successful launch at scale uh, as soon as the specification is ready. So I'd be happy to also uh, take any questions and I know we'll have a little bit of Q&A at the end as well. integrated over the full bandwidth? Yeah, so it's one of those things that, and it's kind of a, a tricky thing of, of where is the, the, the energy efficiency gain when you go to a 5G wideband system. So if, if I took a 20 megahertz 4G uh, signal, I can actually, even with the same transmit power, spread it out in 5G over a wider band, which decreases the power spectral density, right? Because I've stretched the energy out. But then I use spatial processing to collapse that SNR back. So the ability to use spatial processing at the, at the base station side, as well as the device side, but in particular at the base station side, to make that signal more directional enables the energy efficiency gain on the network. So one of the interesting things of Massive MIMO is I don't actually want to increase the energy footprint of the network because one of the things the operators, you know, one of their, their if you pay attention, um, they actually have significant bills related to paying the power company for all of those cell sites. So not only are we making 5G more efficient that you know, it's not tra transmitting pilot signals at three in the morning when there's no users around, but also the fact that those transmissions are more directional. So they're taking that PSD 
stretching it out, but then you're collapsing it spatially. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, I'm Bruno Gruyer from uh, Frost and Sullivan. Uh, so I was going to ask you, let's go back a little bit in time, IS-95 standard, yep. the Barker sequence, remember, it was suboptimal, and I remember studying that, and I said, wow, gee, why, why did they do this? Is like, uh, because it takes such a long time to hammer out the standard, but uh, by the time the standard finally comes out, you end up with something suboptimal. So I was going to ask you, uh, maybe with 5G, I know the dynamics is a little bit different. You see the carrier is hungry to start testing even before <laughs> there is a standard, so to speak. Uh, what can we do to uh, avoid repeating the mistakes from the past so that this doesn't sort of, this sort of thing doesn't happen? Sure. I mean, I guess, I, first of all, I would disagree a little bit. I mean, having studied the Barker sequence as well. I mean, it is something where, the, I wouldn't say that the standard kind of converges for inefficiency. If anything, it is a very rigorous technical debate. And, and so we've always focused, that's why we have a huge, not only do we send a very strong um, team to the standards process, but we have a huge back-end team creating all these very interesting simulations and comparisons to drive that into the proposal. So first of all, I would feel that by having the global momentum of the overall standard, it does ensure a strong technical decision process with a lot of experts. And so the, um, as that moves forward, there is the aspect of, um, of performance complexity trade-offs and timeline, but I don't think it is something where you know, there's a net decrease in performance because of that. If anything, because everybody knows the NRE is gonna be spread on a global volume, it enables people to invest accordingly. But maybe in the interest of time, we can probably take some of these offline and, and I'll introduce our next speaker. So our next speaker, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Mingzi Fan, who's leading our, our shared spectrum research 